Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Kimberly and today I want to talk about a topic that is, in my opinion, it's a very important topic, but it's also a topic that I don't see talked about very often. What I'm talking about today are different collars. This seems very straightforward. Here's the thing. Every tool that you put on your dog has the potential to injure your dog. I want to make that very, very clear. I don't care how much the tool is boasted at being gentle. I don't care how nice it looks. If it's something that you put on your dog, it has the potential to cause harm and it has the potential to cause injury. And the reason I feel this topic is very important is because it's not talked about a lot. So a lot of times people are choosing tools or collars to walk their dogs in or train their dogs in and they don't know the risk behind those tools. And I also want to preface this by saying I do not want to cause fear to anyone, okay? I don't want you to watch this video and feel afraid. I don't want you to watch this video and be like, oh my god, I've been using this tool and uh, it's, it's injuring my dog. No. What I want to say is these tools, everything has the potential. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to injure your dog. It just means there's a risk there. Because, let's face it, if a dog is pulling and jerking in something, there's going to be a risk, okay? It doesn't matter what it is, there's going to be some level of risk of your dog injuring itself. So when you watch this video, I don't want you to be afraid. I just want you to look at this video or watch this video, take this information, and maybe help you make better choices in what works for you, what works for your dog, and how you use these tools. So that way, hopefully, you don't have to worry about risk. You don't have to worry about these potential injuries that can happen. Um, and that's what I want you to take away from this. I am going to make this video as unbiased as I possibly can because just because I don't personally use a tool and there's a lot of tools I don't personally use there's a lot of collars and stuff I don't personally use but that doesn't mean that they're bad it doesn't mean that they're evil it doesn't mean that you are a bad person for using them and another thing that I want to say is I am going to have an unbiased opinion of certain tools on the market that are controversial and um, the reason that I want to talk about them in this video and talk about the potential risks is because um, they're on the market. People can purchase them, right? So um, if people are going to use these tools, they need to know the potential risk behind using them and you will probably be a little bit surprised at what I have to say about some of these tools because um, a, some of these tools people look at and just they don't like them. Um, there is bias against them, there is hate towards them. So this video is going to be unbiased. Uh, if you don't use these tools, if you don't agree with these tools, if you don't like these tools, that's fine. You don't have to use them. If other people use them, that's up to them. That's up to their dog. It's up to what works for them. We're not going to... I do, this is not an argument about the better tool. This isn't an argument about what tool is on top. What is the only tool you can use? What is the best tool out there? Because there is no one-size-fits-all. So this is just, again, this is not fear-mongering. Uh, I don't want you to watch this video and walk away with, oh my god, I'm so scared, I'm so upset that I use this tool. Maybe you're currently using one of these tools and it scares you. I don't want you to feel that way. I just want you to perhaps reevaluate how you use those tools. Maybe look at the way you use them. Maybe you can use them better. Um, maybe you see a tool that you say, hey, maybe that would actually work better for us. So if you use it, that's fine. 
if you don't use it, that's also fine. So anyways, this is going to be a very long video. Let's start with your very basic flapped collars. So these are basically a, this is probably the most common collar. These are just, they're called flap collars, basic collars. So there are some that have buckles. There are some that have snaps, but essentially it's just a flat collar. It doesn't stretch. Uh, it doesn't tighten. This is probably a collar that you own. I think this is the most common collar if you own nothing else. More than likely if you own a dog, you own just a very basic collar like this. So they can be thinner, they can be thicker, they can be leather, they can be uh, nylon, they can be biothane. So the thing about these collars is these collars sit on the neck. Um, now some people have their dogs wear them all the time. So what are the dangers or the risks of these collars? Now these collars are not the best choice if you have a dog who is pulling um, just because when your dog pulls in them it can cause damage to the windpipe, it can cause damage to the thyroid gland because it's pulling, if your dog is yanking, if your dog's untrained, um, maybe your dog suddenly jerks when it sees something. So these are more or less a collar that I would recommend best for dogs who are already trained to not pull, very light, minimal pulling, or just something for your dog's tags to fit on. These aren't really a tool that you should train in. I mean, obviously if you're in a pinch, then by all means, but that's the risk of your dog wearing one of these. If they pull, if they lunge, if they jerk, um, if your dog is wearing these every day, they can sometimes get hung up on things. I've heard of dogs who have gotten their collars hung up in crates, so that's something you need to be aware of. But those are the dangers of these collars. These can also, if your dog is pulling and yanking a lot on something like this, it can cause uh, uh, herniated discs, slip discs in the spine, in the back. Um, that can lead to bigger issues down the road. Again, don't be, <laughs> don't be afraid, but just make note. If your dog is the type of dog who pulls, they could be crushing their windpipe. Maybe they're <coughs> hacking and choking. Um, they could be causing damage to their thyroid. That is the potential risks. That's not a guarantee saying your dog is going to have that happen. It is just a potential risk. Um, the higher risk comes from chronic use, chronic pulling, chronic lunging, chronic things like that. So if that's, you know, you might reconsider. A martingale. So martingales, a lot of people I see training in martingales and they try to use them like a check chain to offer a correction. These are not made for that. So these were originally designed uh, to keep dogs from backing out of them. So if you have a dog that slips their collar, backs out of them, um, these tie into a certain point and then they can't tighten anymore. So these cannot cause choking on your dog if you pull. Obviously if a dog gets twisted up it can because then that can cause tightening when it shouldn't. But in general if your dog pulls on it it's not going to cause uh, choking strangulation just from your dog pulling on it. Um, but this is very similar to your basic flat collar in that if your dog pulls into it it can cause damage of the spine, it can cause damage of the throat, the windpipe, uh, it can cause damage to the thyroid gland there, and obviously uh, if your dog isn't trained and they're pulling, they're lunging, they're jerking, that's the potential risk of wearing one of these collars. So a martingale I would say would be best for a dog who is mostly trained, has a lot of training, isn't uh, isn't big into jerking, lunging, pulling. Um, obviously, again, you can use these for training, but um, I wouldn't expect a whole lot of results training-wise from them. You are more likely to do more damage trying to use them to offer correction uh, than you are to give a very good correction if that's your style of training. If you offer correction-based training or corrections in your training, there's definitely better tools out there than a martingale. Um, if you have a dog that slips his collar, definitely recommend these. These uh, martingales are usually what I, I generally use as everyday wear and tear collars for us. The next most common collar is a choke chain, check, a choke chain, a check chain, or a slip collar. So this is something that just slips over your dog's head. 
and unlike a martingale there is no stop so as long as your dog pulls or as long as you pull it continues to tighten and restrict now these are a very specific collar for training so this is this is a collar for a dog who's actively in training this is a training tool this is not something that you would generally put on your dog to leave on your dog so this is something for active training because it does have the potential to tighten um, and you know if you're not paying attention it can cause injury in that way um, so again similar if your dog is pulling into it it has the potential to cause spinal issues, neck issues. It has the potential to choke your dog. It has the potential to um, uh, tighten so that your dog can't breathe, cause damage to the thyroid, to the windpipe, um, things like that. So this is definitely for, in my opinion, proofing. So if you have a dog, um, that you use corrections with and you want to off if you want to utilize a correction that uh, they will notice this is this would be something for that if your dog is a chronic puller and they just pull the entire walk and they have had no prior training I would not recommend one of these just because they can cause serious injury to themselves but again these are an absolutely wonderful tool for dogs that are in training being actively trained and at the end of the training definitely remove them because the risk of your dog accidentally get hung, getting hung up is big so these are definitely not something that you would leave on your dog at all times and the more common one that people see would be the chain like this so that's definitely what these are for so if you have them on a young puppy who just wants to run, 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 go, 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 I would probably reconsider and definitely say talk to a trainer about helping you use these properly. Another very good reason to keep these specifically for training purposes and to not have your dog wear them all the time is because you can actually decrease how far your corrections go right so if your dog is used to just yanking and pulling on this all of the time they're going to be desensitized to it so if you use this with a purpose and you only use it when you need it and you are not constantly walking your dog in them and they're not constantly desensitizing themselves to the sensation when you do use it in training your dog is going to pay attention and you're not going to need it as often or as much because you're going to get basically more bang for your buck as far as uh, as far as utilizing a correction goes. So the next tool I don't actually own, there are several tools I don't own for one reason or another. The next tool I want to talk about I don't own so I can't really show it to you other than an image. This tool is kind of the thing that really uh, really pushed me to do this video and the reason for that is because it is a tool I see misused more often than not. Head halties absolutely have their place. Um, in my opinion I feel they're probably one of the most misused tools and the reason for that is because they are often boasted as being gentle and non-adversive. Now here's the thing that I want to talk about. The thing about head halties, or any tool for that matter, any tool that tells you that you can put it on your dog without any prior training and the tool stops the behavior is a tool that causes discomfort and or pain to some degree. People can argue with me all day long on this, but if a tool is comfortable for a dog to wear and it is comfortable for a dog to pull in, why would a dog stop pulling? A dog is not going to wear a tool and say, you know what, this is so nice and comfortable. I'm not going to self-reward by chasing after something. I'm not going to do that because this is nice and comfortable and I love it. It doesn't work that way. If you put a tool on a dog 
and it stops the behavior or decreases the behavior without any training, training that tool is uncomfortable to downright painful, right? Whether people want to admit that or not. I've heard plenty of horror stories about head halties and my biggest beef with head halties is people believe that they can put them on their dog without any training and that it's safe, it's gentle, and there's zero risk. And the problem with that is it's a lie. There's a risk with that tool just as there's a risk with any tool that you put on your dog. If your dog pulls into it, if your dog lunges, if your dog jerks, if your dog throws a tantrum. And head halties work similarly to halters on horses. It slips on a dog's head, it attaches from underneath, and the claim is that it turns your dog's head in the opposite direction and it stops the behavior that way. Here's the thing. If your dog is at a level 8 to 10 that it wants to, say, go after another dog, gets excited about another dog, gets excited about a person, just going, is <laughs> they're not magically going to forget that there's something over here. Okay, if, they, if they're lunging at another dog that they see walking past them, that's barking and growling at them, and you turn their head in this direction, they're not just going to say, oh, nothing over there anymore. It doesn't work that way. Okay, because if it did work that way, well, then why would you ever have to train your dog? You just simply put on some blinders and they forget the world exists. So the thing about head halties is with horses... They're very gentle and they're very safe. Um, generally because it's, horses are generally taller, so you're from underneath, right? Okay, so, and the thing about with uh, smaller livestock, goats and stuff like that, they generally aren't lunging in one direction to go attack something. So they are very safe. Now when you have a dog that you are taller than because most people generally tend to be taller um, so they're generally pulling up so you from under the chin up and at an angle so your dog lunges and their head is getting twisted or jerked up and to an angle if you even do that that's very painful okay it it that's how it deters the behavior is it's painful and if you have a dog who just pulls a little bit forward when they see something that's not really a big deal. The big problem is when you have a dog that lunges, that is a chronic puller, that um, has sudden jerks or flails or anything like that, is when you risk a lot of damage to that neck and that spine. That can cause a lot of damage. Just because it's not squeezing the throat, it's twisting the neck in a very unnatural way position. It's twisting that spine and that head very quickly and suddenly in a very unnatural position. And dogs will do this just because it's in their nature to lunge and they're not always paying attention to what's on their head or their necks until after basically it happens and they say this is uncomfortable. But if you have a dog like bull terriers especially, they tend to be very emotionally impulsive and a lot of times they will lunge without even paying any attention to what's on their head. So they may lunge one, two, three, four, five because everything else overrides that pain and that discomfort a lot of the time. Not all the time. Sometimes you'll have them listen once or twice and they say, okay, I don't want to do this anymore. But you really need to pay attention to that. In my opinion, a head halty is not for very small, tiny dogs like Chihuahuas or miniature Bull Terriers. Um, at least not without some level of training. If you have a dog who's prone to sudden lunges when they see something, I would definitely say no. If you have a dog who doesn't, who isn't easily deterred by discomfort from a collar, I would probably say that's not the best option. If you have a dog who you don't have the time or the energy to put into training, I would say definitely try and steer clear of these. Um, if you have a dog who is sensitive 
to discomfort and correction and they can self-correct in this by all means go for it if this is your tool of choice um, if you have a dog who only needs a couple of corrections where they say okay I get it and they listen if you have a dog who you've put in a lot of time and a lot of work into and um, they maybe just do a little bit of this every once in a while I would say by all means but this is a tool that I feel doesn't get enough warning to the public and especially to Bull Terrier people. In my opinion, this is a tool that needs far more um, hesitation or far more caution to people who use them for that reason because dogs can actually cause cervical dislocation. They can actually um, cause the skull and the spine to become separated by doing this. Um, and when it happens, it's sudden and it can cause paralysis and it can cause death. So our next tool I want to talk about is probably going to be the most controversial and that is a prong collar. Prong collars often look a lot scarier than what they are. Here's the thing. Prong collars in general have their wrists, yes. Prong collars when used as a training tool and not a general collar, they tend to be more, they tend to be safer. I know this is an unpopular opinion, but hear me out. When you use something like this, where your dog feels more comfortable to pull in, it has a higher risk of causing worse internal damage from a dog chronically pulling in them. So if it's comfortable or more comfortable for your dog to pull in over and over and over and over again, and you are not offering training to combat this, the risk of severe internal damage to the neck and the spine and the windpipe and the thyroid is significantly higher than if you used a prong collar. And the reason for this is because this is more comfortable for a dog to pull in and sometimes it doesn't cause pain until there's a big issue. When you have a prong collar that is uncomfortable to the skin where there are a lot more nerves, a dog can feel it quicker and they can self-correct themselves quicker before it leads to more internal damage. So if you have a dog who listens to that discomfort, they are much less likely to create bigger problems because they feel the discomfort immediately before it becomes a serious problem. Again, this is a very unpopular opinion because prongs are not legal everywhere. Prongs look very scary. And to say that a prong is not causing discomfort would be a lie, right? Because they are. They're going, that's the point of most tools that boast about stopping a dog from pulling is going to be uncomfortable. Okay, that's just the nature of it. That's just the way that it is. That's just the way tools are designed. Because when your dog pulls, it can cause injury and it can cause internal damage. So prongs work similarly to a martingale in that they stop. They cannot tighten to restrict. They simply tighten to keep the dog from backing out. And the more your dog pulls, the more uncomfortable it's going to be. So what are the risks of a prong? Well, there are risks, of course. There's risks to everything. If your dog is chronically pulling and they ignore a prong's discomfort on the skin, they're going to cause serious damage to their skin. Um, they're going to cause scratching and punctures if they're seriously pulling and they're not paying any attention to this. If you have a dog that blows off anything like that, 
they can cause uh, skin abrasions, they can cause cutting, they can cause punctures if left on the dog for too long. They're not collars that you can just leave on and walk away. They're not collars that you can just leave on for several hours and ignore. They are something that you have to pay attention to. They are something that you have to understand how to use. They're not a collar that you can put on and just jerk, 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 jerk. You don't do that. Honestly, you shouldn't do that anyways for anything, but if you are prone to, you know, pulling on your dog, pulling back, pulling back, that's definitely a collar that you shouldn't use because they're a collar with a purpose. So you have to use them for that purpose, otherwise you're going to cause damage. And similarly, you can, yes, cause damage to the spine if your dog is just pulling right through, if your dog's a little freight train and just pulls right through and ignores any of this. That's going to cause spinal damage, that's going to cause damage to the throat, windpipe, uh, thyroid gland, again, anything in here. Um, so a prong collar is definitely for a dog that is either a sensitive to that discomfort um, or has had at least some level of training. Um, basically that's pretty much every tool. It's not a tool that I would say just slap on a completely untrained dog. It's not a tool that I would put into the hands of somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. Um, you definitely need to know what you're doing in order to utilize it properly. Let's Let's talk about harnesses. There are really two designs for harnesses, unless you want to talk about no-pull harnesses. If you want to talk about no-pull harnesses, actually let's talk about no-pull harnesses first. So no-pull harnesses generally are harnesses that either A, constrict around the ribcage, or B, constrict around the waist. Personally, I don't like these. Again, these are a tool that boasts about being gentle and stopping a behavior without any training. These tools stop behaviors by being uncomfortable. The biggest tool that I would warn against would be the no-pull harness that tightens around, restricts around the belly. And the reason for that is because chronic use of this without any training um, can potentially lead to kidney damage and kidney failure. Um, because unlike your ribs, unlike your rib cage, um, your dog doesn't have anything to stop this from tightening and constricting around the kidneys and it can cause damage there. So it can cause restriction of blood flow to the kidneys and over time, chronically, if your dog is constantly pulling, constantly having that restriction, restriction around that area, over time it can lead to damage. Um, obviously, if your dog wears it a handful of times here or there, that's not as big of a concern unless your dog has already had prior damage or already is having problems with his kidneys. Um, but if your dog is constantly wearing this as an everyday tool and walking in it all the time and is constantly pulling right through it, I would definitely say reconsider. Um, Another of the tools that restricts around here, uh, sometimes they cause those elbows to jut out. <clears throat> I've seen some where they just sit right up under the armpits and the dog has to hold its elbows out. That's very bad for the spine um, because basically your spine and all of your, your bones, your structure is basically like dominoes, right? So if your dog has to walk and they have to outturn their elbows in a way that's unnatural for them, it's going to cause everything else to be misaligned, including the spine. So you're going to have, you could potentially lead to spinal issues, you could potentially lead to hip issues, um, because that spine is just basically like a domino effect. You know, you push one out of order and everything else is going to fall out of order as well. Um, so let's talk about, here's another one. This is a step in harness. This was actually Druid's first harness. Sorry. <laughs> and this is what's known as a, this is very popular for puppies, and this is what's known as a T front harness. So here's the front, see how it's T shaped? Here's the thing. The damage in, or the danger in these is when a dog pulls or even just wearing in general while they're walking, um, these actually sit across in an unnatural way that restricts shoulder movement. And this is actually something, this is actually research more recently that this has come out. And um, 
we are finding that T-front harnesses are actually causing issues with muscle wasting. Um, dogs can't properly utilize their muscle, um, so they have to compensate for that. And that can also lead to um, back problems, spinal problems, that can lead to um, uh, joint issues earlier, that can lead to arthritis earlier because things are out of alignment. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, and the thing about the T-front harnesses is they are finding that the damage actually happens relatively quickly. So that's definitely something to consider and keep in mind. This has been retired as a puppy harness for that reason once I found out. Now I imagine if you've made it this far in this video, you're probably thinking to yourself, God fucking damn, Kim, what the shit am I supposed to use for my dog? Well, that is why when I prefaced this, I said, every tool runs the risk of damage. If your dog is untrained and they pull like a freight train, if your dog, if you're having problems training, if you're just starting out training, there's a lot of tools that can hinder your dog and potentially cause issues, okay? If these are things that you ignore or you just can't seem to get a handle on, they can potentially cause issues and it sucks, right? It, it, it sucks. Again, I wanna reiterate that it doesn't necessarily, this, this isn't a guarantee that you're going to have problems. It's not a guarantee that if your dog yanks for his whole life, he's going to have back problems, okay? It's a risk. And we all have to choose tools based on risk and kind of find what works for us, what works for our dog, and kind of manage that risk. Honestly, everything in life is a risk. With that being said, I have my very last tool that I want to talk about. And this is probably the tool that I will, I, I will probably, if anybody's dog savvy watching this video, will probably laugh at me. But let me explain. This is a tool that I recommend the most for when you first start training your dog to not pull. This is the tool that I recommend the most for training puppies. This is the tool I recommend most for working when you first, first start working on chronic pullers. You may be able to move on to other tools to proof, but this is the one that I say if you're going to start with anything and you want the, to minimize damage for those really naughty dogs that are just ready to go. That would be a Y. See how it's shaped like a Y? A Y front harness. Again, dog people, if you're a dog person, you're probably laughing, right? And you're saying, why would you use that? It's a harness. They're designed for pulling in. It's not going to stop a dog from pulling. And that's exactly why I recommend them, is because these are designed for pulling it in mind. For dogs that are pulling, these are designed to minimize the damage for a pulling dog. So when you have a dog that's dragging you down the street and you're trying very hard to get started in steps one, two, and three for getting your dog to stop pulling, if you want to minimize the risk of damage your dog does to itself. This is what I recommend and that's the reason that I recommend it is because it's going to minimize damage. You can work on teaching your dog what is and what is not acceptable while you minimize damage. And as your dog begins to learn that they can't just lunge and yank and they begin to learn in a positive way what you're asking of them, then you can move on to other tools that really brings it home, right? So if you have a dog that's not open to correction because they don't know what correction is, this is the tool that I would say because obviously you're not going to just start correcting your dog right off the bat until they understand what a correction is, if that's the way you work. 
So this is the tool that I would say. This is the tool that I now use for puppies. This is the tool that I now recommend people to start off with and then graduate on to tools that can really push home what is expected. Because these were designed for pulling. So these support the chest as opposed to the throat. So when they support the chest, they support a wider surface area. So when your dog pulls, it's not concentrating that pressure in one area of the spine. It's kind of spreading it out to, you know, an area that can really take pulling without pushing as much, putting as much pressure on the spine. It's not putting pressure on the windpipe. It allows your dog free motion for its shoulders, for its elbows, for its joints, as long as it's well fitted. You're not constricting anywhere around the belly. You're not causing damage to the thyroid or the kidneys. And I would say the first month or two that you're training your new puppy, this is what I would say. If you have a dog that you just can't take the time to work on their pulling and you want to minimize damage, I would say a good sturdy harness like this with a handle if you have a dog that literally ignores everything else and just kills themselves trying to pull forward, this would be the tool that I would recommend. Some of them like this one has a loop in front. So if you liked the head halty design where it turns them around, this works equally as well, but it does so from the chest. Anyways, this has probably been the longest video I've ever recorded, okay? And I hope that this was insightful. I hope that you take something away from this video. I hope, I pray to God that it's not scaring anybody. I hope that it just lets you have a better understanding of the tools that you're putting on your dog. I hope you have a much better understanding of what will work for you and what won't work for you that is up to you you know your dog I don't know your dog I don't know your dog you know your dog you know you you know what your dog is going to respond to what they're not going to respond to they may respond to all of these tools they may respond to only one of them see that's the spice of life again don't be afraid that I'm, I'm not saying that these tools are guaranteed to cause this injury, but this is the risk. Every tool has risks, okay? Even that harness has risks. What is the risk? The risks of the Y front harness is um, if you have a material that's rubbing and it's too tight, those harnesses are not to be left on your dog 24-7. Don't leave them on your dog 24-7. Put them, put them on for a walk. Your dog can get twisted up in them. So yeah, th those have risks as well. But anyways, this video's gone on long enough and uh, I gotta go. See you guys later. Happy spooky season. And uh, I hope you guys consider subscribing and coming back. And um, yeah, 